We're talking today with Gary Deephouse of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Gary, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in February 8, 1943, and I was born here in Grand Rapids and uh, southeast side, and uh, so basically this is still kind of home for me. Okay, so you grew up in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. uh, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? My father uh, owned a uh, hardware store close by, and uh, mom taught school, and so we, uh, and, and actually taught school in, in the same school that I went to when I was, Okay. You know, now you did get to. Yeah. So what what school was that? That was uh, Seymour Christian School over on uh, Eastern Avenue in Alger Heights, mm -hmm. and uh, and we uh, went to church there also. Our church was close by, so this is all very really much close. In, in the community. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how many kids were in the family? Just my brother. Okay. Um, he was about a year and a half younger than I was, and okay. so. Just the two of us. All right. And then um, when did you finish high school? I finished high school in 1961. Okay. And what did you do after you graduated? I went to, from there uh, to Calvin College and uh, attended there for um, about three years. And uh, at the end of 1964, um, I decided that uh, college probably wasn't something that really suited me, and maybe I didn't suit the college, I don't know, but uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I quit and uh, took up, uh, a friend gave me some information about the United States Air Force, and I enlisted, and uh, three weeks later I was gone. Okay, so when did you enlist? I enlisted uh, in the latter part of September of 1964, Okay. September 20. Now, at this point, was there a substantial draft going on, or was that still fairly minor? We were just beginning the the draft, and um, and the and the students who were in college realized that uh, you know to stay away from the draft, they had to stay in school. Mm -hmm. uh, I hence also recognized that if I wanted to quit school. It was a real risk that me that I was going to have to get it in the draft and probably be drafted into the army. Uh, so um, I decided that uh, to look into the Air Force. Well, a friend of mine gave me the information, as mm -hmm. I said before, and uh, he. Uh, the thing with the Air Force was they let me know that they would train me in any any. Um, well, not any, but certainly in, in anything that I, you know, felt that I wanted to get into. So mm -hmm. it was, we were being trained to serve okay. and, and not have to wait for the draft to be done. So. Okay. Uh, and uh, was the, how long was the enlistment for? The enlistment was for four years. It was a standard four years uh, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that right from the get-go, that's, that's what was going to be the deal. All right. Now, where did you go initially for training? Well, what initially uh, uh, for training to um, a base down in San Antonio, Texas called Lackland Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much where everybody went. That's, that, was, that was the beginning for all Air Force enlisted people. What did the training there consist of? Uh, <laughs> I think it was mostly marching. <laughs> that was primarily it. But uh, as I look back on it, it was a training uh, in order to to uh, get you to understand and uh, uh, accept the fact that there was um, there was a, a a method of of how you acted in the Air Force, and uh, so you had to understand that you were not in control, others were in control, mm -hmm. mainly officers. Okay. Now, how did they instill that in you? I think 
you know, most um, most people would probably say that they um, they broke you down to build you back up. Um, and I won't say that I, I broke mentally or physically anything, but I, you know, I certainly came to understand that. Uh, look, um, I'm not in control anymore. Um, my superior officer or my my uh, superior NCO was in control, uh, which was fine with me. You know that way I, I understood you know, understood pretty much, you know, how things were written in the sand. You okay. know? So was this things like you know what your how you wore your uniform or how you kept your own things in your area or made your bed or everything to perfection. Okay, everything to perfection. Absolutely. So. Right. And how long were you there? I was there for uh, eight weeks. Um, all the time, we continued training. Um, although toward the end of the eight weeks, uh, it wasn't uh, as dedicated as it was uh, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, they taught you how to wear your clothes, how to shine your shoes, and uh, and how to how to act. Of officers, etc., mm -hmm. etc. So, uh -huh. um, but eight weeks was it, and then I was um, uh, sent to uh, another um, place, another base. Okay, where did you go next? I went to. Um, let me let me backtrack a okay. little bit because um, during. Um, during my basic training, they put you through a battery of tests. Mm -hmm. you know, tested you uh, mainly in writing. They wanted you. They, want, they wanted to know about you and what your strengths were and what your your abilities were, and what you wanted to do. They gave you some choice, and uh, I could have been a cook, but I ended up being a a um, an air traffic controller, or at least training for that. Okay. So um, the training base for that was in Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at the end of the eight weeks, I went to Keesler. They flew us over there. And I went through air traffic control school for, uh, let's see, until March, March 23. Uh, so I went from, uh, well, let's see, that would have been November to March, so that's about four months. Okay. Now, what did the air traffic control training consist of? What were you learning? Mainly, that was a series of uh, courses dealing with things that you had to learn in, in order to control uh, and take care of your job. Uh, we started out with uh, learning how to recognize weather. And how to um, how to state the weather to maybe an aircraft, and we got all the way down into how it how you um, could um, what a control tower would look like, and also how radar would look like. And so because radar was also part of it, we could recognize the scope and recognize aircraft on a scope and training for that. So, but it was all training and phraseology. You learn how to state things so that they were understood by a um, an airplane a pilot. So um, it was interesting. I really found. I really. I really loved it. But, uh, right now, at this point, were they not using computers yet for this? This was all still by hand or otherwise. Uh, you know what? I went in thinking I was gonna. Uh, I wanted to be in computers. I didn't see a computer the whole time. <laughs> uh, now computers were were computers were uh, cathode ray tubes and and vacuum tubes and they they just weren't not what we think of in today's day and age. Right. Okay. Uh, now, what was life like at at Keesler? How is that different from being in basic training? Uh, Keesler. Um, we were we were a little bit more on our own. We weren't we weren't under the thumb of a, of a of um, an NCO, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an I commission officer. Yep. Um, we weren't. Uh, we were had a little more freedom. You know, uh, we went to school in the day, and at night we were pretty much on our own. We could 
and uh, do what we wanted. And you started, you started turning things around from being under the thumb to uh, a set of freedom. Uh, you, you certainly had to, you learned how to act, so therefore now you got to use it. Okay. Now, would you go into town and go to bars or movies or things like that? Uh, yeah, there was uh, Biloxi at that time uh, was um, was a different place than it is today. Uh, Biloxi was uh, very quite racist yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of the things that uh, were true in the early 60s, 50s, 40s were still true. Mm -hmm. um, bathrooms for coloreds, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So I had to learn a little bit about that. I mean, that was a revelation. We didn't have that in Grand Rapids when I was brought up. Yeah. Now, were there black airmen on the base with you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And did they just not go to town, or were they just careful? I think they were careful. I think they were careful. Um, but I didn't see much of that on the base, mm -hmm. uh, much of that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, we were co-equals uh, on, on base. You know, uh, you may you may have been your your rat mate, so to speak, mm -hmm. or your bunk mate. You know, may have been a a black airman, but didn't make any difference mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. yeah. So those are two different worlds on the base and off the base yes. as far as that went. Okay. Yes. Uh, now, once you completed this air traffic control training, what's your next stop? As part of the um, part of the course, um, they let us choose uh, where we might want to go next, what area of the country. Um, because the next assignment is going to be uh, on the job training. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I put in, a, in for a number of things, but uh, I, was, I was pretty much Grand Rapids raised, hadn't been outside of town very much other than to maybe somewhere in Michigan or Chicago mm -hmm. or whatever, but you know, over and above that I had not been around, so to speak. Anyway, um, one of the places that I put in for was the southwest um, of the country. They give you some general localities. You can northeast, south, west, mm -hmm. east, et cetera, et cetera. And I did the uh, southwest. I had never been to the southwest. It always had fascinated me, Arizona, et cetera, et cetera, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I simply put in for the Southwest and not knowing what was available or what I was going to get. And just prior to um, the end of my training, uh, they gave me orders uh, to go to New Mexico, the state of New Mexico. And um, southern part of New Mexico, um, all encompassed uh, places like um, uh, White Sands Missile Range, uh, a lot of desert down there, um, and the city close by the base was uh, referred to as Alamogordo, New Mexico. And so uh, that was that was my next uh, next place to go. Okay. So what was the name of the base you were actually on? Should have said that. The next base the next base name was Holloman Air Force Base. Okay. It was right next to um, the White Sands, excuse me, the, yeah, not the White Sands Missile Range, but the White Sands National Monument, which was a, a national park. Right. Okay. All right. So, so what was there at Holloman? What kind of air units were there? What was going on? There was uh, several interesting, uh, interesting portions of that. Um, uh, the biggest uh, group that was on the base, along with uh, the rest of us, was a, a unit of uh, Air Force planes and pilots that were training to go over to Vietnam. And so uh, they trained for quite a while. I was there for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, they trained for about a year and maybe a year and a half, and suddenly the whole aircraft squadron, and I mean, and people, mm -hmm. and every piece of whatever went to Vietnam. You didn't see them again. 
Also, there was a portion of the base that um, dealt with um, um, missiles. Um, the range next door to the base, which was quite a ways away from mm -hmm. the base, but the range, it, it all dealt with um, 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 firing missiles, maybe, at, at as part of the war effort, mm -hmm. but also um, it was part of uh, research and technology uh, where it came to firing missiles into space. So uh, there was a whole uh, there was a whole command of that type of thing there. Also, it's very interesting. Um, north of the base uh, was uh, there was a, a spot where they tested and and shot off the atomic the first atomic bomb called the Trinity Site. It was up in the desert, and uh, the Trinity Site um, is still there. It's still visit. You can visit once a year. They open it up, mm -hmm. and you can go there once a year and see it. But, so uh, a lot of interesting uh, things to see, different types of aircraft, all kinds of, of uh, interesting, as best I can say, is. Interesting aircraft, a lot of them I still see in, in various um, uh, museums, mm -hmm. which I go to. <laughs> well, what, what kinds of aircraft were there? Uh, one, of the, one of the most fascinating ones that uh, I had the ability to, uh, the privilege, excuse me, to control was, a, was an aircraft called the SR-71. SR-71 was turned out to be, and this was just in the development stage, of, of that aircraft, but it ended up being the fastest aircraft in the world. And um, it, uh, it was basically a spy plane. That's all it really was. Mm -hmm. it, it flew out over Russia and came back and, and took pictures. And um, so, but we had one come in our base one day. It was, it was in trouble because he had, he had an in-flight, what they call an in-flight emergency, mm -hmm. and he flew into our base, and um, got we got to see him. It's probably the only time I've have seen one other than in 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 museums. Mm -hmm. Now you can you can go there to museum. In fact, I think they have one down here in Kalamazoo, mm -hmm. at the museum there. Okay. Now the squadrons that were training there, what were they kinds of planes were they training in? They were training in what they call the F four, the F four C or. F4. You know, the C model of the F-4. Um, it was a fairly new aircraft and uh, um, it did the yeoman's job in, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of other ones, but um, uh, primarily it was the F-4C. All right. Now, how did, now you're going there, you said it's essentially on-the-job training. So how do they orient you into that? Or when you get there, what kinds of things do you start doing? Well, you start at the you know, start with the menial stuff of making coffee, <laughs> <laughs> and all of that, and uh, then they set you down in a. I, I can I mostly was in a control tower. Mm -hmm. They set you down in a position that uh, doesn't uh, include um, <clears throat> the primary stuff right away. Not until you can you can train into it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then from there you, you go on, you learn how, but you, all with uh, the idea that, uh, excuse me, not the idea, all with uh, the, um, the idea that you had somebody standing over your shoulder mm -hmm. watching what you were doing and what you were saying. And uh, that way it was just on the job training. You learned how to control with uh, uh, aircraft uh, that were okay, you saw him, you saw him, Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, you know from there you just you learned um, you learned how to put them in you learned how to keep yourself out of trouble by, by not running two aircraft into each other that that you didn't want to do. But, uh, okay, now how did they treat you? I mean, did did they handle you well or effectively? Or yes, you became you you became a um, a community. Good way of putting it. Um, there were other people on my level. There were other people 
above me, and certainly the officers and NCOs mm -hmm. who, who had been there longer. And um, uh, it certainly wasn't like basic training. It was, uh, you were there to do a job, mm -hmm. and that's precisely what it was. You, you, you learned the job, and uh, you did it correctly, and if you did it correctly, if not, you let you know. Okay. So, so what would a typical day be like at that job? Primarily, um, um, because uh, air traffic control is, uh, has to be somebody on duty all the time, uh, we went into a, we were always on duty, but it was based on uh, shift work. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were four shifts a day, what they called a mid-shift, which was overnight, a swing shift, which was the evening, morning, uh, which was primarily six o'clock to noon, in the afternoon, it went, it was a six hour mm -hmm. time period mm -hmm. all the way through. And uh, so, uh, you didn't work all afternoons or you didn't work all mornings, you rotated these on a daily basis. So one day I started off as a, on a swing shift, the next, very next day I worked in the afternoon, the very next day I worked in the morning. And from there, he went right over into the mid-shift, and then it was just a constant rotation. So how does that affect your sleep pattern? Uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, after we were done working the mid-shift, we had a whole other day until we started the swing shift again. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had plenty of time to catch up on sleep if we needed it. Uh, obviously, you didn't, uh, you didn't sleep on duty, but... Mm -hmm. uh, um, It was okay. It was it, it was it was a job, and it was a um, something that you were there for to do, and uh, I enjoyed it. Okay. Right. Uh, and what do you do when you're not on the shift? Well, there are two. Uh, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we used to we used to, we used to uh, do a lot of traveling around the area. There was a lot of uh, a lot of things to see. Um, I used to go down to Mexico once in a while because we were we were about 80 miles north of El Paso. And uh, but for the first year that I was there, I didn't have a car. I had a bike. Mm -hmm. And so I would bike from my barracks to the control tower and back and forth. And that was pretty much the extent for the first year. Mm -hmm. After that. Um, I went home and got the car that I had left there and drove it back down there and had a car for mm -hmm. the final year. So we drove around and saw various things. By that time I had established uh, some friendships with uh, other men, um, my age, my group, and uh, we would do uh, things together. Mm -hmm. uh, there were sports. Um, unfortunately, I, thought, I think we saw a lot of drinking too, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> uh, the Airmen's Club, the NCO Club, etc., etc. So, and there wasn't really much of a town to go into or anything, was there? Yeah, there was, but it was, uh, it was 12, 15 miles away. Um, I also got, uh, I was also in, um, I enjoyed, um, you know, how should I say this? I started in <coughs> worshiping in the church mm -hmm. chapel, the base chapel. Mm -hmm. And from there, I was let that go by. <coughs> I, um, I worshiped in the base chapel, but I also uh, joined their choir, the base choir, mm -hmm. chapel choir, me and a number of other people. Um, and we had a good group, and so we. We sang at all the Sunday services, and uh, I got uh, I was did that for for the whole two years, mm -hmm. pretty much. So. <coughs> all right. Now, at this point, did you have a girlfriend or anything like that, or were you on your own? No, uh, I was on my own there, but uh, I was writing letters to to uh, a special. A uh, gal that I had left back in Grand Rapids, and uh, um, spent spent a lot of time writing mm -hmm. throughout the whole time. Um, if 
that uh, kept a lot of those letters too. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've gone and you signed up for a four-year hitch, and there's probably an expectation that you may wind up overseas. Were you thinking you were going to get sent to Vietnam, or did you have enough control over assignments that you didn't think that? Uh, good, uh, good, good insight. Uh, yeah, there wasn't much control over it. Uh, um, it was always the specter that, yes, uh, Vietnam was there. Uh, a number of the people uh, who who got it reassigned while I was there, certainly went to Vietnam, but they also would go a lot of other places. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a matter of timing. Uh, Vietnam and some of the other bases were considered remote assignments. Remote assignments were never more than a year at a time. Um, if you didn't do a, and get a remote assignment, generally that you went to like Germany or Europe or some other spots, those were always considered um, two-year assignments mm -hmm. and maybe even a three-year assignment. Well, here I was uh, already two years into my four years, and so those assignments were were there, but uh, you never, well, I suppose I could have requested to go to Vietnam, but I, <laughs> I, I chose not to do that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, anyway, we... Um, I'll just carry that forward. Let's, uh, I, I suddenly got an assignment uh, and uh, was not Vietnam, but it was a remote site. It was considered remote. It was in the island, excuse me, on the island of, of uh, Taiwan, which is off the uh, coast of China. At the time, excuse me, it's still called Taiwan, mm -hmm. but it was at the time it was called Formosa. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so I got assigned to that and uh, um, finally had to leave, leave some good friends in, in uh, New Mexico and uh, uh, they flew us out to uh, Taiwan. Did you get a leave home first or had you had yeah. leave earlier? Yeah, there's some leaves all in this. Okay. <laughs> That's good. You get 30 days a year leave, however you wanted to take them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you know, if you qualify for them. So, uh, yeah, I took a 30-day leave um, back home in Michigan, and then from there I made my way to uh, the West Coast, up to Seattle, and then flew over to uh, Taiwan. Okay, and so do you remember the route you took to get from Seattle to Taiwan? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, um, it, the Air Force started, uh, excuse me, the military, let's put it that way, started flying people over mm -hmm. rather than, because they needed people as much as possible, rather than putting them on ships and, and going that way. Um, so uh, they flew us from uh, Seattle to, stopped in um, Japan briefly, very briefly, didn't even let us off the aircraft, fueled up. And then they went down to Tai uh, to Taipei, which mm -hmm. is the capital of Taiwan. Got off there, had to find a bus to go down to my base, which is about halfway down the island, in a small town called uh, Taichung. And then outside of Taichung was the base, and uh, we shortened the term to CCK. It's called. Ching Chung Kang Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it turned out to be a, a, we were coexisting on that base with the Chinese, used to be the Taiwanese, yeah. the Chinese. Nationalist Chinese, yeah. Right, and um, so, uh, but there was a huge American buildup there on the base, primarily to support um, the the war effort in Vietnam. So all of the aircraft that we um, controlled in, um, in CCK there were um, transport aircraft, uh, all with the idea of uh, material movement and troop movement and everything into Vietnam and Thailand. So we went all different directions there. Um, but um, 
never saw any 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 um, combat or anything mm -hmm. like that. I just um, Taiwan was was it as close as I got to Vietnam. Right. And, uh, met a number of people who did go there, um, and um, those stories are are hard to get out of some of the some of the people who went there. They still don't talk about it very mm -hmm. much. But, hey. Okay. Uh, now, uh, for you, I guess the so you said you were sharing a base with the, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. and how much did you see of the Chinese Air Force or their personnel? Oh, good question. Yeah, we uh, we control about um, well, I'd say about uh, twenty or thirty percent of all of the ins and outs of, of traffic into the base was was Chinese, mm -hmm. mostly fighter aircraft of theirs. Uh, they were continually trying to harass mainland China. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they fly out of our base and uh, go over toward mainland China and drop pamphlets. And, <laughs> and the pamphlets were, uh, you know, to get them to egg them on, I guess, mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, to harass them. Um, but there was never anything ever came of it. But um, they were the 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 aircraft, the fighter aircraft, were there to protect the island from uh, invasion mm -hmm. by the Chinese. So, did you ever have a, a sense that they thought that was likely, or did people assume it wasn't going to happen? Um, no, they. Uh, I don't, Looking back on that, I, I can't say is that they were they were um, setting themselves up to uh, fend off invasion. Uh, I think that the the fighter aircraft were there for that. There may have been some sites out along the along the um, water along, mm -hmm. along the coast, uh, anti aircraft sites, whatever. Uh, but I uh, didn't see much of that. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just kind of living, they were just kind of living in equality. Mm -hmm. You know, you stay over there, we'll stay over here. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what kind of uh, facilities did you have in that base? What were your own conditions like? Um, our own conditions were pretty much like uh, any other um, aircraft, excuse me, um, any other uh, base that I had been on up to this point. It was barracks. Mm -hmm. um, barracks with rooms in it. You had roommates. Um, and um, it was okay. Um, but that was all the American side of the base. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese uh, airmen and Chinese workers lived in their own, if not in town, because mm -hmm. we were close to, uh, close to the Taichung. City, so, um, and we had all the comforts of home. We had a movie theater, and we had uh, uh, BX, uh, PX, BX. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, a lot of the things that uh, made life. They were still building it as I left. They were still building a base pool, uh, swimming pool, and um, a couple of other things that uh, made uh, life. A little more bearable, mm -hmm. rather than having to live in, in a tent or in a foxhole or something like that. We did. We right. like pretty good. Yeah, yeah, Air Force. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you go off the base much into town or around in Taiwan? I did. I did. Um, when I wasn't uh, on duty, um, we could always catch a bus, uh, um, uh, Air, Air Force bus or a. Taiwanese bus mm -hmm. or whatever into town. Um, a lot of things to see. Um, nobody ever bothered you. Mm -hmm. um, Taichung was a city like like any other big city. It uh, had all its um, traffic problems and and uh, but um, all the same same stuff. But everybody else had you know, all the schools and. The, and um, the railroad station, oh boy, this goes on forever, you know. 
<laughs> uh, I would, I would think that uh, we discussed this the other day, my my wife and I. Uh, um, the only thing I never got used to was um, the open sewage, what we called the Benjo ditches, and uh, the smell was always there, it was always, always present, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and open sewage is exactly what it is. Yeah. It was. So. And the climate's kind of warm and humid, isn't it? Um, not too bad. Okay. Not too bad. Um, the city itself was relatively close to the, um, the coastline. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a hurricane come through one day. And <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> but we had a, excuse me, not a hurricane. Typhoon. A typhoon. Yeah. The spoke there that was uh, I don't know, a huge amount of rain, just huge, um, and wind and everything. But we were confined to the base and confined to our rooms. Um, we didn't have any other uh, cellars to go to or anything like that. It was mm -hmm. too many people for that, but uh, we managed it. Okay. And so the barracks didn't blow apart in the wind. No, or <laughs> no. Oh, they were. Um, there were some. There was some damage, though. Certainly, yeah. Um, but now, uh, won't pin me down because that was fifty years ago. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, how did the Chinese people seem to view you guys? Um, no different than than anybody else. Um, I I will say that. Uh, and we had a lot of friends, but there was always the language. Mm -hmm. Language barrier. Uh, although I think that uh, a lot of them who wanted to deal with the Americans, who wanted to sell to the Americans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the tailors and the people like that who were who were trying to uh, get their American business, mm -hmm. uh, they had a vested interest in learning some of the language so that they could uh, speak, uh, so that we could communicate. So. Mm -hmm. So if you went into town, you went into a restaurant or something else like that, you could function? Yes, although there were some things down there that I'm, I'm not sure that I could look, look in the eye and eat. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was some of that was um, whatever, but they, they had some, some, some places that catered to the Americans. Mm -hmm. and to the, uh, so it was interesting. Okay. Of course, this is also now. What years or what year were you actually in Taiwan? Well, that was um, that was the um, nineteen sixty-seven for the most part. Mm -hmm. yeah. About, the most about part. Yeah, the yeah, chronology was, list. Yeah. Okay, all right. And so that's that's a, a, a time when a lot of young American men are interested in, in a lot of things, including things like sex and drugs and rock and roll and so forth. And does that carry over when they're in Taiwan? Uh, yes, it did. Um, well, a number of uh, the, the people who I served with all had um, their their girlfriends, quote unquote, mm -hmm. downtown. They lived downtown. They rented apartments down there, even though they had a place in the barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was that. Most of them were married, but they had that, mm -hmm. you know, on the side. Um, I had one uh, one gentleman one day who went, passed away, died, overdose, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there was there was that, but it wasn't prevalent. Right. I mean, nobody tried to get me to mm -hmm. take drugs and smoke weed or you know, whatever the case may be. Maybe. Maybe more of that went on in Taiwan, or excuse me, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of it depended on where you were and when you were and what yeah, group really, you were with. You really did. And so, yeah, and, and and so forth. So the other, this sort of, I mean, I ask because, not because I have anything in particular that I'm expecting to get, but rather no. to find out. Well, okay, was that there or not, or do you notice that? Uh, and then I guess the same thing also goes with the question of racial tensions. Um, did you notice much of that where you were, or no? I think that probably the most prevalent problem was was alcohol. Mm -hmm. Huge amount of it, uh, even in my own dorm room. Not, 
that was with three other guys because mm -hmm. we had four guys to a dorm room. Um, and uh, uh, the bar was always open every day mm -hmm. in, in our room for some reason. I don't know why, but it was in our room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, there was a there was a countertop there, and uh, you name it, they had uh, you know had all of all of the various. Uh, um, liqueurs, you know. Where would they get them from? Could you well, buy them on base uh, or just go into town? You could buy that on base. Okay. Yeah. And the, and the BX. And, well, you could, you could go in downtown too. Um, but there was, yeah, you could buy beer, you could buy li liquor. You could, mm -hmm. Sure. It was all available. Mm -hmm. But um, drinking to excess was a problem. Uh, I wasn't used to it, and uh, um, but I certainly didn't uh, enjoy it terribly much. But you know, I, if, if I wanted to uh, be part of the group, mm -hmm. you had to join in a little bit. You had to have a few beers here and there, and nothing yeah. to excess. But. Uh, right. Well, I mean, was that did that become a problem for any of the air traffic controllers? I mean, were there ones who couldn't perform the job properly? Not that I know of, um, but uh, yes, uh, you 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 minded that. You know, a lot of guys. Okay, I can't drink today. I've got to go on duty in three, four, six mm -hmm. hours, whatever the case may be. Now, did you mostly associate with the other controllers, or was there a broader range of people that you were with? Broader range. Um, that's that's good because I was part of the um, Air Force Communication Service. That included a lot of things, mm -hmm. uh, not just air traffic control. It also included, and in this case, we were at a remote site, so uh, the Air Force was responsible for the telephones of all things, the telephone system, and uh, they built this whole telephone system where you know in those days why you didn't have it. A punch button telephone. You had a rotary dial, mm -hmm. and so you go to this building, and you could see all of the equipment work as part of a rotary dial. I don't want to get into that, mm -hmm. but you know, you know, there was other things. Uh, mm -hmm. There was um, um, uh, radar they were responsible for, mm -hmm. and there was um, uh, a number of. Boy, it's not coming to me right at the moment, but uh, yeah, the communication service included a broad range of, of communications. Okay. Uh, now, did you have officers that you reported to, or senior NCOs, or? Certainly. <laughs> um, I mean, who would you mostly deal with or give you your assignments? Uh, mostly, uh, I mostly dealt with, uh, we had to, we coexisted in the in the control tower with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Chinese did all of the controlling. We were just advisory. Okay. Okay. So this is perhaps I should have said this earlier, but the, we were just advisory there. I was I was the only American up there okay. at the time in my shift, and the Chinese were uh, responsible. They wouldn't let the Americans re uh, control their own aircraft, their own jets, because mm -hmm. we could couldn't talk to them anyway. Yeah. But they had a command, a small command of, of English that they would control the American aircraft. But you were there to um, to help them if they got in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, if if uh, the um, English pilots or the American pilots say, I don't understand, then then you got on and, and did your job. Okay. Was that a common occurrence? Uh, no. No, it really went quite well. Mm -hmm. it really went quite well. Um, as far as um, who we dealt with, why there was always the chain of command. Mm -hmm. um, you had uh, uh, you were a shift worker, but uh, you know you were responsible up the line with uh, to an NCO who was also responsible to the squadron, um, the squadron um, commander mm -hmm. who was an officer. And when you were on a shift and you're you're the only American there with the Chinese, was there like one Chinese person that you would talk to and then he talked to other people or, uh, or did he talk to the, yeah, the they, officer? Or? It pretty much, 
that's it. They pretty much all, uh, sp you know, would communicate with us as okay. American, as in English, broken English. Mm -hmm. um, um, the strangest part of dealing with uh, the Chinese is the fact that they brought their own lunch, but they cooked their lunch in the tower. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned how to eat rice mm -hmm. like this. Yep. <laughs> But I didn't. I, I, uh, I would eat in the mess, mess hall before or after the shift or whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of interesting things to see. Um, and um, one of the things we did when uh, the squadron commander one day asked, invited me into his office and asked me if I would set up a um, something with our our squadron with a local needy um, well how should I put that we adopted a a a um, orphanage mm -hmm. okay. And it was all little kids who had nowhere else to go, but they were kept in the, in the orphanage downtown. Mm -hmm. And so we established a, a coordination between them. And I was given the job myself and another fellow, given the job of uh, heading that up. And we would collect funds every once in a while and, and um, seek from them a need. Okay, what do you need? Oh, we could use this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we would buy it at the at the base, um, basic exchange, and, mm -hmm. and give it to them. Okay, and uh, we'd have a little party, and the commander would come out and invite all of the the squadron, um, you know, as many who weren't serving or weren't on duty, to come out. And uh, well, that's one of the little little things underneath mm -hmm. that uh, that I did, but. Uh, I never got a ribbon for it or anything, okay. <laughs> which is okay. I'm right. doing it for that purpose. Okay. And are there other aspects of that stay in Taiwan that kind of stand out in your memory? Um, not, not really. Um, I, I think that um, we learned. Uh, well, I took a couple of leaves. No, mm -hmm. excuse me, one leave. Okay. We flew to, flew to Japan, and I got spent a week up there on, on leave, uh, seeing what uh, what uh, what that was like. Uh, Tokyo was was really fascinating with all the lights and uh, pretty much still the same, I guess. But. Uh, um, That's, that's pretty All right. much it. All right. Uh, and now when you finish up uh, at Taiwan, so you're there for a year, basically. You mm -hmm. rotate back. 15 you, months. Okay. So you've got... I'm sorry. I'll you. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's how the Marine Corps did things. Yeah. 13 months. Okay. Uh, you have that, that assignment, and now you still got about a year left on your enlistment then, or how much time? Um, he had about six months left. Okay. All right. And so what do they do with you for that last part of your enlistment? Uh, they reassigned me to a base uh, back in the United States. Um, and I should stop that for mm -hmm. just a second okay. and just kind of uh, relate a little bit. Um, uh, my girlfriend at the time and I were trying to decide whether we were going to get married uh, before I went over t to Taiwan mm -hmm. or wait t until after. Okay, and um, the the upshot of the whole thing was that we we felt that we would be better off if we waited, mm -hmm. and so um, um, I uh, I had six months to do, and so I came home, and I walked into her kitchen and surprised her. And uh, very soon thereafter, uh, we got married in uh, Denver, Colorado. 
And from there, we took a little bit of leave time, but then we drove uh, all our sessions, lock, stock, and barrel, and we drove them down to Phoenix, Arizona. Outside of Phoenix, Arizona is Luke Air Force Base, is where I was, where I was assigned. Okay. And what was going on down there? Um, there too, it was all uh, aircraft um, training for them for the United States. It was all fighter fighter aircraft training at uh, at Luke, and I was in a squadron of uh, radar um, assistance. It's tough to explain, but it it, it was a it was a unit uh, set aside to. Uh, to train ourselves in how to control aircraft in a remote location such as Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it was training almost for Vietnam. Well, I had just come back from a remote site, because, mm -hmm. so they weren't they weren't going to send me to back to Vietnam right. very quickly. In fact, that was a promise. You, they they yeah. said, "You're next. You've done a remote assignment. Now um, we're going to." You know your next assignment, wherever that is, and whenever that is, will probably be something longer, like a two-year assignment. Mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah, assuming that you re-enlisted. Assuming I re-enlisted because I only had six months to do. Right. And uh, um, when it was kind of getting closer, we looked at each other and said, "Okay, what do you want to do? Because here's where we're going to go next." Mm -hmm. Two of us, uh, we anticipated looking at that, even though we we've been home for six months. I've been home for six months, and um, we decided to um, to um, get out. Okay. Quit. So um, when they called me in and said, "So what are you gonna do?" and they dangled in front of me my next rank. Mm -hmm. Uh, an E4 rank, excuse me, an E5 rank, mm -hmm. uh, and they said uh, ten, 10 days after you re-enlist, you'll get this rank. And um, but that wasn't enough to get, you know. We decided to get on with the rest of our lives, and and um, subsequently we we stayed in that area for another eight years, seven and a half years. Okay, lived there. So what did you do there after you got out? Um, well, being an air traffic control, I could have stayed in that type of job and gone to work for the FAA, mm -hmm. Federal Aviation Administration, and got a job controlling aircraft or radar, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. I, uh, I, I looked at that, but nothing was available right at the moment, and so I took a job um, with an insurance company. And uh, uh, I thought it was pretty good, two dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. <laughs> and I, and then I got raised to two and two fifty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I went to work for them and worked for them for another eight years before we before we left. So. And then did you come back to Michigan after that, or? Uh, yes, yes, we did. We tried to make a decision. Uh, by that time, we had uh, two kids, and uh, we wanted the grandparent influence. And so we had a choice, go to Denver mm -hmm. or go back to Michigan. And uh, my father was smart enough. He says, hey, I know somebody who will give you a job. And so that was it. We went for the job, All right. and uh, we moved back to Grand Rapids. Okay. Did you stay in the insurance business or move on to something no, else? No, I didn't. I didn't. I went into into sales and worked for a you know, steel company. Steel. Oh, uh, yes, raw steel. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went into um, tool and die sales later on. So, okay. Before I retired. All right. Uh, now, if you look back at the time that you spent uh, in the Air Force. What do you think you learned from that or took out of it? Um, I think they, the Air Force, again, wanted you to accept responsibility and accept 
Um, that's the best word I can come up for. There are other words, but you know, that's primarily you. You acted and you accepted responsibility for what you did. Mm -hmm. um, but you knew that, and so therefore you you watched what you did, and you did your job the best best you could. So best way. Does that then carry over into life after the Air Force? Yeah, I'm too much of a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist at everything, you know. Mm -hmm. That clock back back of us here goes off at, the, at exactly the right minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a few other things, so. Yeah. I don't think that's a bad quality for an aircraft controller to have. I don't think so either, you <laughs> bet. All right. uh, but I still admire the Air Force. I admire um, airplanes. Um, all of these, these um, things over here, I admire. They don't mean much. They're just ribbons of, mm -hmm. of, um, of uh, denoting various types of service. Uh, this right here is um, the communication service badge. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, a couple of uh, other things which I didn't know about until just a year or so ago. So you went and found out what medals you were owed, and yeah, right, you know, right. Yeah. So and this is the various pieces of rank that right. I that I held. So. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, it makes for a good story and a rather different one from normal. So thank you oh, very okay. much for taking the time to share it today. You're, you're welcome. Three of them. Turned out.